Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of 286 Project with me, Chris Akers. And on this podcast, we talk about arts, culture, politics, sport, and anything else worth talking about. Now, today's guest, I'm happy to say, we're going to talk about one of my favourite subjects, which is boxing, which regular viewers will know the podcast I'm a big fan of and I write about sport myself. But this is a slight twist on it because he's talking about boxing in films, where boxing is probably the one sport that gets depicted in his, um, films a lot. Um, and it's, 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 my today's guest has written this book, Smash It, all about movies um, and boxing. His name's David Curido, um, and he's Curcio. Curcio. My it, apologies. It's not intuitive. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> That's um, okay. He's going to talk about his uh, book now, his brilliant book. Um, hello, David. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we get to the crux of the book, can you just explain to our viewers? Um, I've said you obviously written this book, but who you are and basically your journey up until this point. Um, well, I'm actually uh, trained as a fine artist and continue to practice. I um, am currently a professor at Suffolk University in Boston in printmaking. I'm trained as a, as a printmaker, uh, both in with a master's of fine arts from mm -hmm. Pratt Institute in New York. And uh, I taught in Italy for many years on the college level and at, at various other, through other various study abroad programs. And um, you know, some adjunct work here and there when I got back. Uh, and I have spent time on residency studying Japanese woodcut, teaching, Japanese woodcut abroad and um, working in uh, in a Florentine etching studio for a while. So really, my background is in fine arts. Uh, there came a point about, boy, about 10 years ago where I became interested in writing and began to feel that what I was doing with imagery at the time wasn't wasn't fully satisfying and I had more enjoyment with the manipulation of words and began writing art reviews and then book reviews mm -hmm. and ultimately became interested in boxing, primarily uh, the older, older fights and almost exclusively older fights. I'll say right off the bat, I don't follow the contemporary scene. I find it hard to keep up with, though I did just order a smart TV, which gives me access. Uh, so we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. There is a, a curiosity tugging at me. Uh, and I've always, I've always been, um, uh, I don't like the term movie buff, call it what you want, a cinephile. You know, I, I high and low, but uh, watching uh, uh, films is always, you know, a lifelong passion. And with the with the interest in boxing, the two sort of merge together. But the background comes from is is fine art, which seems wholly separate from the subject matter at hand. So what was the first boxing film you remember watching? I imagine it was Raging Bull. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, I suppose I would have been 10 years old when Rocky III came out. So I think that would have been it. Uh, I, I, while the chapters included in the book, it's much more of a cultural study than, uh, I, it's difficult to consider it a boxing film. I mean, of course it is, there's lots of boxing, but it's, it's very predictable and, you know, it's, it's perfect for that age, you know, it's for, perfect for a 10 year old kid. So I would say that is the first boxing film I recall seeing where as Raging Bull would be the first serious boxing film um, I'd watched. And obviously we'll talk about the rest of the films in the book, but why was it about that film in particular that you liked, even at the age, was just a splendor of it? And was it the film that really sparked your interest in boxing in general? Certainly not Rocky III. Uh, and to an extent, not even Raging Bull. 
uh, I mentioned in the book that a lot of people view that less as a boxing film than as a character study. I, I've always disagreed with that viewpoint. I think it's, it's a full on boxing film, but I had, uh, you know, interest in my early twenties in the great directors, Scorsese being, you know, certainly a uh, contemporary who, you know, since I suppose it was the King of comedy with the first film I saw of his as a kid. And uh, after I suppose in the early nineties, after Goodfellas came out, I had, uh, you know, I began to read up somewhat on method acting and had a fascination, you know, to, r- read some books on on Scorsese and uh, Robert De Niro, his his approach to method acting, his work with Joe Pesci. So I very much watched it less as a boxing film than as a, uh, <laughs> again, as many viewers would have it, a character study and just a very, very well-made film. Okay. So, yeah, because with Raging Bull, I'd, I'd always been a fan of the, the sport from like a young age, like nine years old, but I'd never watched Raging Bull until I was about 21, mm-hmm. and I was a friend of mine. And it's interesting you talk about your background before you started writing, because I remember buying a DVD of the, um, of the film Raging Bull, and there's like extras where it talks about the making of it, um, the decision to make it black and white, the actual how to make the sounds, etc., and that in particular really fascinated me. Um, so, yeah, so that, so is that something that fascinates you as well? Because obviously, you talked about imagery is how the movies are put together and how the fight scenes are choreographed. There was nothing like that at all. A hundred percent, and I would say Raging Bull is one one of the prime examples uh, that I cover or that I discuss in the book where filmmaking is, you know, Martin Scorsese being a well-known uh, a perfectionist, uh, fidelity to his subject matter, uh, Robert De Niro being the same way, discovering Joe Pesci uh, almost at random and choosing him as his uh you know this this very little known actor slash song and dance man to to work with him and and to live with him uh, you know act as brothers that had that was that was what attracted me to the film uh and its depiction of of the boxing while histrionic, I don't feel was overly exaggerated. I think the the shots were very brief. The fights were very, uh, you know, cut together. Um, Thelma Schoenmacher, the the editor, did a fantastic job. There are very few very few fights in that film, if any, that that retain a real fidelity to the original. To the original fight, I think you know, and Scorsese was very aware that he was taking taking great liberties with the with the fight scenes uh, as shot as opposed to how they actually occurred. But mm-hmm. having said that, it was all in in the service of of art, and and it ultimately comes across partially as an art film for that reason, and I think. You know, I think without the the editor, Schoenmacher, I believe she pronounces it Schoenmacher, actually, um, I don't think we would have had the same film. I think it was really a collusion of of actor, director, and editor. Scorsese, it took a long time for Robert De Niro, who had read the Lamada's autobiography to convince Scorsese to to make the film. Scorsese always always saw boxing as uh, as he said from one angle on TV, you know, where he was interested in in edits and stories. Uh, he he had never really understood um, 
boxing as it was filmed, despite his imp- his appreciation for for some of the great noir and boxing movies that had that had preceded it. Um, so he went into it with with some reluctance, but also uh, ultimately became character characteristically obsessed with both subject and storytelling. Yeah. It's interesting to talk about Scorsese not being interested in that film because I think on the DVD actions I watched, he was talking about, he was more of a music fan. So he was more into like bands like The Clash, for instance. He wasn't mm-hmm. really a sports fan at all. And I think he mentioned, he talked about whether it's a character piece or a boxing film. I think for him, it was almost, he saw the ring as a metaphor for um, for life that the ring was basically where you played your life out once you, you was you lived it outside. Um, and I was just wondering, actually, with the film, would you say a lot of boxing films are like that in the sense of, yes, okay, they're, they're gonna have boxing depicted in them, but in a way they're pretty character-based in that the ring's just basically something that's an anchor to like the rest of the um, lives of the protagonist of these films. Absolutely. Scorsese himself said, that anyone who thinks this is a boxing film is crazy. I disagree with him, but it is a way of, uh, of I do see his point. Uh, you know, m- many of his films are about redemption. You know, as a Catholic, this is something he, he has covered in numerous films. I will, I will admit that in the last 20 years, I've seen very few films of his, uh, you know, the, the generally the De Niro combination really did it for me. And once he started, you know, I I've missed a great deal of his recent work, but he, you know, his early work, you look at a film like, you know, Mean Streets as a, as a prime example, even Goodfellas to an extent about, um, about, you know, characters, accepting, embracing, or rejecting redemption. And I think uh, a low life like Lamada is sort of the perfect character to, 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 for that to play out on screen. Yeah. In regards to the movies you chose to talk about in the book, what did you base your choices on? Were they just personal favorites or did you have a theme running all through them? Well, Per the book's subtitle, Race, Crime, and Culture in Boxing, I I wanted to give both um, a history of the sport, but more important, how that sport, how, how, how the sport was reflected in Hollywood to address larger overarching issues, mm-hmm. uh, cultural issues, historical milestones over the 20th century, uh, you know, again, as is mentioned in the, the subtitle, uh, crime being a large part of it, taking a much larger part than I expected. Going back to Raging Bull, I think that it really does a, an excellent job of, which is overlooked and not discussed, of talking about the way the mob controlled boxing at the time that, you know, Jake LaMotta couldn't get a fight without, without taking his dive against Billy Fox and the, the character, uh, based on, based on Frankie Carbo, uh, you know, I thought, I thought the mob played quite well into that as it, as it did into, into earlier films when, when the mob had become glamorized. In choosing the films, uh, I, I I tried not to fit any round hole uh, round pegs into square holes, but there were I would say there were a couple that didn't make the cut, and there were a couple. There was at least one I would say one that I felt to address the subject of religion in film, which I do in a couple chapters, but Catholicism, particularly, uh, 
Kid Monk Baroni was, you know, is perhaps the weakest link in terms of film, but I think it served, it served, uh, uh, it, it was a very good template for examining Catholicism and boxing. Conversely, I wanted to talk about a very important historical facet of boxing in the 20th century, which would have been the Third Reich, the Lewis Schmeling rivalry. But despite at least two films that I'd been able to find on the subject, the films just weren't, didn't have the, weren't meaty enough. They weren't very good films. And while I could extract enough from Kid Monk Baroni to make, uh, it was a briefer chapter, but a, what I thought was a solid discussion of, of Catholicism and boxing, I really didn't feel that the films, uh, one was called Joe and Max, the other Fist of the Reich, that I could, that I could use those films as as a serious basis for that rivalry. And if I have one, I don't want to call it a regret, but if I feel that there's one area that I didn't get to cover enough, it would have been, it would have been that era, the Third Reich, which does come up, you know, in discussions of Max Baer, um, of, of Joe Lewis, but the, and, you know, I do discuss Max Schmeling, but I don't, I, I didn't do the delve into the rivalry and to the ramifications, to the, to the extreme ramifications of those bouts and what was going on. But as they say, you can't fit everything in. And that was, you know, so it was something I, I would have, you know, I, tried to incorporate it. I spent time attempting to. In fact, I wrote I wrote chapters on on both films, but ultimately they they just couldn't make the cut. I I couldn't in good conscience release them uh these really subpar films. You one of the things I noticed in your list, unless I'm mistaken, that there's no boxing documentary films. Was that something that you were thinking of placing in it or did you just want it in terms of acting in general um did you decide to leave the boxing documentary films out in general however the last chapter tyson by james toback from 2008 yeah. was a documentary and i felt it was a good conclusion uh to a discussion of 20th century boxing and the that the director, James Toback, was ultimately outed less than two weeks before Harvey Weinstein and the, the Me Too ha hashtag came about. And it just seemed a way to, to wrap up this Hollywood history up to, up to more or less the present day. There were, there were fighters like Tyson that I felt needed to be included. I thought he was uh, a good fighter to to a good note to end on. And again, it was a documentary. I think that both Cinderella Man and Ali are fairly subpar films. In fact, I think Ali was crap. But having said that, there was there's an example where while I do discuss other films that about Ali, the documentary When We Were Kings, the the film that that he made himself, the greatest, the the recent film based on the play One Night in Miami, I thought, you know, Michael Mann's film covering, you, you know, really covered so many aspects of Ali that. I, while I could write about the film itself critically, I, it, it, it gave a great deal of information about the cultural zeitgeist of the, uh, 
early 60s to early 70s. And particularly, uh, you know, Ali is such a fascinating character. And I feel that no book that that does cover great fighters can leave can leave Ali out. And I thought it was it was the most all encompassing in terms of, you know, historically, the nation of Islam, the uh, the rumble in the jungle, why why Zaire was chosen as the venue, uh, his his relationship with his wives, all of those things, you know, the film did include them though I found, you know, that I had to constantly correct, you know, actually what was happening was this. So I think, you know, I look back and I, I feel like I, I, I spoke harshly of Michael Mann, but I think the film deserved it. Cinderella Man with the other one. I didn't think it was a very good film, uh, despite the fact that a lot of boxing, uh, boxing people did find it to be, to be a pretty decent film. And nevertheless, in its in its coverage of the Great Depression, the the rise of crime, gangsters, particularly at the time, like Oni Madden, uh, his his rivalry with Max Baer, the looming of of Joe Lewis on the you know on the horizon coming up, uh, it it felt like an important uh, contextual facet of the book and so that the you know i i did include the the film and i thought russell crowe did a good job i don't want to completely disparage the film one of the themes that especially in the first half of the book with the films that you review is a lot of them seem to be based on the mafia unboxing yes why do you think because obviously from the earliest 20th century why do you think that is is that just because the way boxing was intertwined with the mob because um, it almost becomes a stereotype, like with a lot of those films, like old oh, boxing the mob, etc. Yeah, it so. it does, it absolutely does, and I think that really launched with Kid Galahad in 1938. Um, we see a little of it in um, uh, a few years before in the Prize Fighter and the Lady, but it's it there's a lot more. I want to say levity to it, but it's not quite as as ser as as serious. But I I wanted to discuss you know, crime was not just a facet of boxing, but it was a facet of cinema. Uh, we look at uh, early pre-code films like Little Caesar or The Public Enemy, two are two good examples of the glorification of the gangster and the public's fascination with crime. Uh, which continued, I mean, it still continues if you, if you just look at the best, the nonfiction best-selling list, uh, the popularity of true crime, the, the number of true crime podcasts and, and streaming documentaries. I think, uh, you know, uh, the popularity of villains in cinema in general throughout the, you know, since the inception of, of cinema. So, you know, the public does have a fascination with crime and that really seemed to, to be fomented through the medium of film. So some of the early, early gangster films were extremely popular in depicting unsavory characters and the public went to see them. They didn't see, they didn't go to watch them get gunned down. They watched to see their criminal activity. And there was a great deal of fascination right through. I mean, you know, like I said, it continues to this day, but I, I, I maybe think about something like, well, Raging Bull, as I mentioned before, uh, which was 1980, fairly recent. And um, a numerous films. I mean, it, it, you know, it comes up a great deal. I'd say it comes up in at least half the chapters. You know, I haven't done a, a careful, a careful scan of that, but I do think that, you know, the public was attracted to to the to criminals, 
the the 1960 Kafavar hearings where that examined criminal ties to boxing uh, had viewers rooted to the uh, just just glued to their screens while Jake LaMotta was uh, was grilled about his dive against Billy Fox. People people like to hear about criminals, you know. Mm-hmm. Being a Boston guy, uh, I, you just couldn't get enough about Whitey Bulger here. And uh, you know they made a film of him, which I understand is terrible. They've they've you know there's several books, but it's 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 everywhere. Uh, we can't get away from from not just violence in films, but but criminals and and the fascination of them on so many levels. And gangsters were the, you know, at the time in the 1920s, prohibition and then the lifting of prohibition, looking for other avenues of income, one of which with the control of fighters, uh, you know, it makes for it makes for good storytelling. It makes for a good um it, it makes for great entertainment especially as you know these real life gangsters are appearing regularly in newspapers people want to people want to read about them and people want to want to see fictionalized versions of them as well yeah. Yeah. we talk about the mob and boxing and that's happened for the last few decades where boxing and the mob seem to be associated or um intertwined in movies that seemed to change with the Rocky franchise. And I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Rocky 2. That's in your book. I don't know if it's that old original one. But... Rocky, the original Rocky, and then Rocky 3. Yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts on those two films that you've put in your book and also the franchise as a whole? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I had been, before... You know, as I was writing the book initially, as I set out to write it, I was still sort of dismissive of of the Rocky films, even the first film, which I hadn't given a good viewing in decades. But the the fantasy element of it that, you know, no no fighter is really going to get a, a, a title a shot at the champ. Uh, you know, no unknown like that. You know, it, it really is. A, it's a fantasy, but it's a love story. It's it's more than just a boxing film. Uh, it's what a lot of people, what most people probably they go, you know, who are who are not familiar with the, uh, you know, if we can call boxing films a genre, who are not familiar with the genre would would refer to as a boxing film. It's a love story. It's it's also, um, but it is considered you know, a boxing film. And there is, you know, boxing really doesn't enter the picture until the second half. But in terms of film, you know, guerrilla filmmaking, filming on a low budget, the the dubious claims on Stallone's part that it didn't have to do with the Wepner, Ali Bout, all of those things, you know, brought great, made it into a, uh, made it much more intriguing to me and yes while crime was very peripheral the the leg breaker for well, rocky was a leg breaker for a, a gangster in the first film and he um the gangster was very supportive of him so you know he was never under under threat um the way some other fighters were or or you know the the gangster just bet on him and gave him any support he needed as to the franchise i think it it quickly became a cartoon Mm -hmm. Uh, i i certainly feel that way with rocky three but i had my own reasons for writing about it and not because it was the first air quotes boxing film i had seen so much as uh the the 1980s uh you know the the glamorization of a of a new kind of male lead. Uh, you know the musculature, the uh, the almost the eroticizing of of the male figure, the body build bodybuilders, uh, body in action films, and that sort of thing. 
uh, th there was a lot. I, I just thought there was a lot of fertile, fertile ground in there to talk about a shift from the '70s, which is you know a very unique decade in filmmaking, into into the into the 1980s. And but I don't believe I've watched Rocky films past the fourth, which I would have seen in junior high. Mm -hmm. And I must have seen it more than once. I must have seen it on cable or something like that back in the day. But I thought that too was sort of a cartoon. And uh, after that, I did tune out uh, until the Creed films came out. I watched the I watched the first one. Uh, was was disappointed and and not entertained. So I, I didn't I didn't follow up with the rest. So. While it is, you know, I look at it like just a money machine, ultimately spawned from a from a great film of, you know, kind of a had a felt like it had a one in a million chance of making it and really, really captured the public and ultimately came around. Who cares how realistic mm -hmm. the situation was? It's a good film yeah. for numerous reasons. Indeed. One of the thing, um, films you depict in the um, book, which I'd heard of, but I've never actually watched, is Girl Fight. Um, why was it that made you decide to write about that film? And also, have you seen many films where, or boxing films, where a female boxer is a main protagonist? Because other than Girl Fight and Million Dollar Baby, I'm struggling to think of any, if there's any at all. I had written, uh, besides those two, uh, I would say generally just documentaries, with the exception of a of a Thai film called Beautiful Boxer, which was about um, what I suppose, uh, well, what I know is referred to in in uh, in Thai culture as a lady boy. Uh, mm -hmm transsexual fighters and that but that veered more into the realm of mma mm -hmm. which i wanted to avoid as much as possible that is not boxing and i may be in the minority in that i did not enjoy million dollar baby i found it to be a, a bit schlocky and so Girl Fight, I definitely wanted to cover a film about women in boxing because it has become uh, it has become normalized at this point. There is still, as I write, much more sexualization of female athletes than males. Um, and you can still hear commentators talk about it you know that it, it's still there's still some sexist language used to used to describe female athletes but girl fight you know had both the element both both the fertile ground for discussing females in boxing while at the same time uh, a beautiful coming of age story about why somebody might get into the game, male or female. So, uh, uh, you know, at once it is a, you know, it does allow for discussion of, of women's boxing without, uh, w without feeling forced because uh, the, the story could have, could have applied to a, a male as well. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm just wondering if there, is there a boxer that you can think think of who hasn't had a film made about them that you would like in the future for a film to be made about them because their lives are just so interesting. Well, I I tend to shy away from biopics in general, not just about boxers, though of course some are are are, are covered. I think. I would love to see, though, Barney Ross was the inspiration for Body and Soul. And 
the subject of monkey on my back, I would I would be interested in in a, a Barney Ross or a Benny Leonard documentary, a rather uh, biopic uh, about Jewish fighters in the 1920s and why they were so prevalent before virtually vanishing from the game. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there's been sort of some direct to cable, direct to DVD, non non theatrical release uh, film, uh, at least one on Dempsey. I think that would be interesting in folding in the Roaring Twenties. But in general, you know, I have seen suppose hands of stone foreman was in theaters for about 10 minutes so yeah, yeah. I missed that. and everybody i spoke to said it wasn't you know don't waste your time i did go i did see hands of stone which i thought was was really out of whack i thought it was a you know ultimately a a poor film and I don't, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I think the only, the only, the only, the only, the only viewers who would be attracted to a film like that are boxing fans. And they would all be disappointed at the, at the numerous inaccuracies in the film. So I, I don't, you know, and then I watch you, you take a film like Ali and who can play Ali? It's sort of like making a film about Abraham Lincoln or, you know, this, uh, I understand Scorsese is planning uh, a biopic of Frank Sinatra. And sometimes I just feel it's like, leave these people alone. It's it, they're impossible to reproduce uh, by another actor. So, but, you know, I can hold out hope for, for something along the lines of a, of a Dempsey or maybe some early, some of the earlier black fighters who, who didn't get the credit they deserved in their day uh, due to the color line, uh, potential opponents for Jack Johnson, who he rejected. I think, you know, a film about, about that color line being drawn both by whites and by Johnson uh, could be, could be quite fertile. It would not be a, a biopic as such, but more about a cultural zeitgeist. So where can the boxing film go now? Because obviously you've depicted what you've depicted. It used to be about crime and the mob. Um, and now it's become more sophisticated. I just wonder, I had an, I interviewed someone um, last year for the podcast and we were talking about biographies because she, she wrote biographies. And I said, well, would you write um, biographies or real life events today? Because everyone puts their stuff on social media. And I just wonder with boxers, if you're trying to be a boxer today, I imagine that would be a disadvantage because you know what the boxer's like even before, even before you put them on screen because they depict their lives on social media so much. And I'm just wondering, not just with boxing, but in sport in general, are people's lives interesting enough to depict now on film or do we put too much of ourselves online and therefore there's no mystery with people when a movie comes out? I think the mystery, uh, the mystery reveals itself in what the director and screenwriter choose to, de to choose to change about mm -hmm. about a life. I mean, we'll go back to Raging Bull and the Joe Pesci character, Jake's brother jo Joey, is a complete stand-in for Lamada's friend. Pete Savage. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have the same kind of relationship with his brother that the film would have you believe. Lots of the incidences between Joe Pesci and De Niro's character actually took place uh, with uh, between Lamada and his friend Pete Savage. So I, I think in in viewing again a, a film like Hands of Stone is a good example. Um, we Cinder, Cinderella Man's another good example of 
what was changed, what is manipulated in order for the for the audience to appeal greater appeal to the audience. I think, you know, what comes to mind right away is the depiction of Max Baer in Cinderella Man as, you know, a kind of stone cold killer, which he was not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, you know, the film needed a villain. I, you know, and this goes back to, you know, the, um, the, you know, the public love of a villain. Meanwhile, there was so much uh, mob activity surrounding all those 30s fighters. I thought that was a lost opportunity for the film. But, you know, the, the current state of, of boxing films, you know, I, I believe I quote A.O. Scott, the film critic for the New York Times in the introduction to the book as saying, with the exception of, I'm paraphrasing, but with the exception of the romantic comedy, no film genre is so formulaic as the boxing film. And I, I wholly disagree with him unless he's referring to say, accepting Raging Bull films, you know, wide release boxing films that came after Rocky, where it's, we know the outcome, you know, we, we, we almost always know the outcome, even though Rocky ultimately lost um, it. Today, a lot of the films, we already know how things are going to turn out. The, the box is going to win. I look at older sport, even in the, you know, earlier seventies, it's not a boxing film. It's a baseball comedy, but a, a, a film like the bad news bears mm -hmm. where, you know, the team, you know, it's all about, you know, rallying this team and, you know, you imagine maybe they can win and they don't, but it's still a, a great film. I don't think we see that so much anymore, but I don't, I don't flock to every boxing film that's released anymore because generally I think that AO Scott's, comment has has proven true over the last over the last several years though going back to some of the earlier films i i wholly disagree with with his his assertion of their formulaic nature i don't think there is one what next for you is your next book going to be about boxing or are you just going to be moving away from such subjects i would move away from boxing yeah. yeah i would like to stay with film i have there are ideas percolating, some of which, uh, you know, the the amount of time, the amount of viewing involved um, would is borderline prohibitive. <laughs> to, but, um, you know, this is what we do. And so I'm starting right now by writing essays that I hope to shop around. Mm -hmm. on on the subject matter and that that might prove enough but right now i don't see a return to boxing uh in my writing film is likely you know i've been looking closer at, at television but it's more the television i grew up with so you know uh sitcoms and again addressing uh race and and gender and the you know changing social mores the audiences to whom they had been geared moving from the you know from the very early days of television until recently but i really wanted to keep it contained you know between say 1975 and 1985 but at this point you know it, it would it, it's very hard to imagine, let's say, uh, watching a show like All in the Family, which is a great show, but watching it all the way through every single episode, every or or something like The Facts of Life or, you know, shows that would fit in to to the to the model for the book. But that's a lot of work to watch mm -hmm. shows that can be frequently substandard and, you know, seven seasons worth, each of which contain at least 22 episodes. And 
Um, mm -hmm. And then writing about that. So it's very daunting. So right now it's a toe in the water, uh, which is starting just the way the, the smash hit started, which was with articles that turned in that ultimately were reworked into chapters for the book mm -hmm. Good. david it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you i'll leave a link in the bottom of the description in regards to people who want to uh, purchase the book as i say i've had good reviews about it so well done on uh, writing it and all the best for your writing going forward i really appreciate it chris i had fun oh, cool. thank you, thank you very much Take care.